are we all today? Fine. You doing good? Fine? Good. Good. Did anybody notice my treasure chest when you came in this morning? How many of you saw that up there before I moved it? You, you, you saw it, didn't you? And you, you knew what was there. You're thinking, wonder what Pastor Dave's going to do with that. Well, let, let me ask you. What would you put in a treasure chest? What would you put? Gold. Okay. And you said what? Toys. You put your toys in it. What else can you put? Legos. Legos. You put your Legos in. That would be great. That keeps them off the floor, right? Okay. What else? Special things? Yeah, absolutely. There's so many different things that we can put in our treasure chest because we want to keep them safe. We want to keep them protected. We want to keep them picked up and different things. But a lot of times when we think of treasure chests, we think of those special things, don't we? Well, does anybody want to guess what I have in my treasure chest? What would you think I would say is my most precious treasure? What do you think? Money, that is not my most precious treasure. What would you think? The Bible. The Bible. You're really close. Because my most precious treasure is my relationship with Jesus. But today, I want to talk to you about the one that comes a pretty close second. Does anybody know what my second most precious treasure is? It's not money. You know what I guess? What do you think? Can I point you in the right direction? <laughs> <laughs> my, my second most precious treasure, only second under Jesus, is my wife. And, and she, she, she's a treasure to me. And, and I cherish that treasure. Now, do you think my wife fits in that box? No. Don't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> that would get us all in trouble. <laughs> But so so you're, you're guessing that I don't have my wife in there, right? And I don't have Jesus in there. But I do have treasures in there. And that treasure, those treasures, are something for you. And, and here's what I did. I put several different treasures so that you can choose what is your treasure. And the reason I did that is because we have to choose our treasures. And, and there's a lot of folks who, they don't choose Jesus. That's their most precious treasure. They should, but they don't. And there's a lot of married couples who don't choose their spouse as their second most precious treasure. But they should. So I want you guys to choose your treasure, but then as you do, I want you to think about how we have to choose what really is our most precious treasure. So you ready to see what I have in there? All right, here we go. All right, you guys can choose. Sort through there and find something that you think is the, the, that's going to be your treasure for the day. Then if you find something, you can go back to your seats. <laughs> they don't like my choices. <laughs> Or are there some changes? 
Last week we, we, we realized that we don't just always stay at the attraction stage when it comes to the opposite sex. So we took that a step farther and we began to look at the dating relationship. And through that, you know, we, we believe that, that this is the person that, that, that God could be leading us to a marriage with. So we go out on a date. And as we, we do that, we begin to look at, at that person. And here's some things we realized about the dating relationship. Is that there needs to be standards in dating. And there needs to be accountability in dating. And we also realized that our world doesn't teach us that. Our world teaches us that, that we can just do this, do that, go out with whoever, you know, have a hundred girlfriends a year if we want to. I remember one time on a youth weekend trip, one of our teenagers had three girlfriends over the weekend and was excited about having all three. You know, and that's what our world teaches us in standards. So, so we had to learn that there needs to be standards, there needs to be accountability. And we looked at what the Bible teaches us about dating. About but how many of us this morning know that that, that attract, what begins as an attraction and then leads to dating often leads to something even deeper with the opposite sex. So today, what we're going to talk about is we're talking about getting married. And that person we marry and how to have a greater marriage relationship. And to do that, we're, we're going to jump into chapter 2 of the Song of Solomon. And I want us to see three important aspects of marriage this morning from chapter 2. So let's begin there together. Aspect number one. For, for a great marriage, love needs to be your banner. When we look at it, love is your banner. Now let's look at what that means. In, in chapter 2, let's start at verse 1. It says, I am the rose of Sharon. A lily growing in the valleys. Like a lily among thorns, so is my true love among the young women. Like an apple tree among the trees in the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. I want to sit in his shadow. His fruit tastes sweet to me. Now, if you remember, I told you that, that we're looking at Hebrew poetry here. So it, it's not always the way we would, we would express something. And so we have to kind of see what they were meaning and knowing that. And also in the Song of Solomon, you have three different voices who are speaking. You have the voice of the male talking about his female lover. And you have the voice of the female talking about the male lover. And then you have the voice of the friends who are also giving them advice. In these three verses, it starts with the female. And she says, I'm the rose of Sharon, a lily in the valley. And then the male says... This is what I love about you. And then in verse 3, the female says, this is what I love about you. So it kind of gives us an understanding of who's talking here in these verses. But if you look at it, in verse 2, look, look at what the guy says there. We read it like this. Like a lily among the thorns, so is my true love among young women. And here's basically what this guy is saying uh, about the female that he's fallen in love with. He said, my lover is like a lily in the middle of a thorn patch. And, and he says something like, you know, my lover is a lily in the, in the middle of a bunch of thorns. Now, how many of you guys wish you'd have thought of that last Monday? You know, that's pretty good stuff, isn't it? Baby, you're like a lily standing in a bunch of thorns. I, that, that's sweet. I think she'd like that. How many of you guys think that? Try that this afternoon. Well, or the next time you get in trouble, just, which might be this afternoon, look at her and go, you are a lily in the middle of a bunch of thorns. See if it gets you out of trouble. You just try that and see what happens. But that's what he's saying about her, that the, when he looks at her, she's special. And then the, the next verse, she's given her thoughts on him. And here's what he says. He's like a perfect apple tree. Standing in the middle of a bunch of common trees. So again, she's saying he stands out. He's, he's better than all the others. And she goes on to say, you know, I love to sit in the shade of this apple tree. His fruit tastes good. And what she's saying is he is so great. Do you think these two are smitten with each other? 
Absolutely. And, and in chapter 2, they're talking about you know, that engagement time as they're, they're getting ready to, to be married. But I want to show you where her thoughts come from. And that's kind of where I want us to start focusing today. Her thoughts come from verse 4. Here's what it says in chapter 2, verse 4. He leads me into a banquet room and looks at me with love. Now, here's kind of what he's saying, because this is one of those situations in the Bible where our English language leaves a little bit to be desired. And to try to put it into English, into our language, we say, you know, he leads me into a banquet room and looks me with love. But what she's saying is it's far more than that. She's saying something along the lines of, I think he's perfect. Because when he walks me into a room filled with people, his love for me is so great. It's like he's flying a banner over me that declares his love. So some of your translations will read that way and say, his banner over me is love. And it kind of, here's the picture that, that, that she thinks so much about him because his love for her is so great. And it's as if she feels like every time she's with him, that he's got this flag flying over her that says, I love this woman. And, and doing that, she feels different things about him. The idea of the banner comes from the military. It, it always has. And if you think about it, you know, the military would carry their, their, their banner or their flag or their, their fighting colors. And as they would go into battle, the idea was if they could see that flag, there was still a reason to fight. And, and you ever watch an old Civil War movie? You know, they're going into battle and you got somebody that's a flag bearer and they're carrying their, their, their banner or their flag into war. And, and maybe, you know, I mean, they're, they're all they're, they have is a flag. And they get shot. There's guys who will drop their guns to go pick up the flag. Because if the banner is still flying, there's a reason to fight. She says, he holds a banner over me, and that banner is his love. Folks, if we know that our spouse holds a banner of love, if you as a, as a lady know that your, your man loves you so much, it's as if he's flying a flag over you that says, I love this woman then you know there's a reason to fight. And looking at that, there's some things that I want us to see about that. I want to give you three. Number one is his banner of love shows that there's a promise. As he flies his banner of love over her, it shows her that there's a promise. Now, I, I want to talk to our married guys for a moment. When is that time that you knew that you knew that you knew that you knew that she was the one. That, that time just went, when all of a sudden you're like, I know this is I mean, can you think about that time? And here's why I ask that question. We, we live in a world that, that sticks with the dating. I don't understand how they do that. Honestly, there, there became a time when I knew this was the one. And I knew that this was the one I was going to marry. And I know this is what I was going to spend the rest of my life with. There was a time that I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew. And there was, there was not a doubt in me. And so I, I look at folks and I'm like, how can they not know if that's the one? Because when I knew that I knew, I was ready to get married. I, I, we, we, we met them in April. We had our first official date in May. I proposed in December, and we were married the next May. And I want to tell you, I would have done it a whole lot sooner if I'd have understood what student loans were. Because I thought if I waited until she graduated college, I wouldn't have to pay the bill. Nobody explained student loans to me or wouldn't be married before that. Because there came that time I knew that I knew. I remember we, we met, and, and we went out a couple times, and... and it only took me a couple weeks. I started saving for a ring. I, I got my peanut butter jar and I started putting money because I knew I was going to be buying a ring soon. I knew that I knew. And so I wonder what kind of banner 
Do we as husbands fly over our spouse? Do, do we have a banner of love that shows, I know that I know that I know that I know. This is the girl for me. And I love her. You know, the, the gal in our text knew that, that she was the one. She knew that his love was the real thing. And she, she knew that. She knew because his banner was love, she had his promise, she had his commitment. And she knew that that commitment was strong. She knew that, that when he was away, he still loved her. She knew that when he was in the fields and then veiled women came along, she knew that she didn't have to worry because he flew a banner of love over her. His love for her was so great, it was like a banner flying over her. Guys, I, I want to tell you today, your spouse <laughs> needs that commitment from you. They need to know that you are the one. And, and, and let me just be honest for a moment. You can tell them a hundred times, but if you're not showing them that, they're not going to believe what you're telling them. You need to apply the banner of love. What made their, their relationship so great? He had a banner of love over them. And it was a, 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 a banner that showed a promise. The second thing I want you to see there is his banner of love shows that there's protection. She felt protected. Verse 3, what she said, he's like a big apple tree and she likes to sit under the apple tree. And as she, she's talking there, what she's doing is, is she's saying, I'm comfortable with him. I know that he takes care of me. I know that he'll protect me. She feels safe. His love for her is so great, she feels safe when, when she's with him. She finds comfort in the love that he has for her. And let me give you the third thing, and then I'll explain that. The third one is his banner of love shows that she is his treasure. She is his treasure. Look at verse 8. It says this. Listen, my beloved. Look, here he comes, leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills. Now, how many of you picture this guy frolicking through the fields to come to her now? That, that, that's kind of the picture that you have, or it's more of a picture of swiftness. Look at the first part of verse 9. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Now, we look at that and we're thinking, okay, now she's picturing her lover as, as a deer or a gazelle bounding through the woods coming to her. That, that's not what she's picturing at all. But look at those animals for a moment. He, he's picturing, she's picturing him coming quickly to her. And she uses these animals as her analogy, and the gazelle and a stag is a buck deer. Now, looking at those animals, there's some really unique characteristics that each of those animals have. And that's what she's using to describe her lover. You know, think about the gazelle. A gazelle can run 60 miles per hour. So, so if, if she's looking at the picture of him coming home to her, you know, she's thinking he's coming home fast. He's not dilly-dallying in places where he shouldn't be. So, so it's that picture of a fast. But there's another characteristic about the gazelle that I find amazing as I, I study them a little bit. And that characteristic is called stalking. And it's something that gazelles do. And the males will do it more, more than anything else. If, if a male spots danger, it begins to do this thing called stalking. And what it is, is that the gazelle will stand stiff-legged, and stiff-legged, it will jump to where its body is higher than its head. So I picture this thing also, stiff-legged, straight up, straight up, straight up. And it's also studying them, and like, you know, why do they do that? <coughs> well, one of the reasons is probably to alert the rest of the herd that there's a danger there. And, and so it'll start the, the, the spotting. But the second reason that we find is... He wants to show that danger that he's alert and he's full of life. And it's not going to be easy. Now, take that picture of, of a, a gazelle starting and think about, she says, my lover 
is like a gazelle. And, and what is, he's watching out for, for danger, and he's going to alert me when there's danger, and he's going to show that he's full of life, and, it, and it's not going to be easy to get me. The other one is, is a buck deer. And, and I know many of you hunt. You ever watch the buck deer when they have the scent of a doe? I mean, it's funny, it's like they stick their nose out farther than anything, and you can almost see their nostrils. Why? Because they, they, they smell a doe somewhere. Holly and I was going up I-81, and you know there's lots of traffic on I-81, and all of a sudden this shooting buck comes running up, and, and, and it didn't make it across the interstate. But you know, that buck wasn't thinking about the cars. Because when we saw him come, his nose was sticking out and his nostrils was big. And I know, he had a doe on his mind. And that semi, or in his, his case, that Mercedes, he didn't care about it. Because the only thing on his mind was that doe. Now listen, this is how she describes her lover. She says, he's like a buck deer. When I'm on his mind, nothing else is in his mind. So, so what she's saying is, this banner of her love, of love finds on me. It shows me these things. Guys, what kind of banner do you fly over your life? Well, what, what kind of, does she know that your love is great? When we think about it, does she know, is, is the banner of love so great that she knows your promise? You'll keep it. Does she know that you and feel your protection? Does she know and believe that she is your greatest treasure? You want to have a great marriage? Then love needs to be your banner. Number two, this one's pretty simple. Solomon tells us keep the fire in the fireplace. What would you do this morning if I'd have brought my wood, my kindling, my striker, and just right over here I'd have built a fire in the middle of the service? Now, how many of you would have been okay with me doing that? My sons. <laughs> Everybody else knows that if I build a fire, it's going to burn a million down, right? Because this is not a place for a fire. But where it is? Somewhere where the fire is contained. The fire needs to stay in the fireplace. Look at the second half of verse 7. She says, Do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. And, and here's what she's saying by that. She's saying intimacy has a time. And intimacy has a place. And that time and place is marriage. And, and she's shown us that. That there is a time and there is a place for them to be intimate. But we know that time and place isn't until we're married. Now our culture tells us something else. Our culture tells us that intimacy can be anywhere with anyone. And it can be with this one this week and that one this week and this one the next month. And that's what culture teaches us. You know, they're looking for love in all the wrong places. But our culture teaches us that's okay. Here we have a picture of intimacy. Our picture of intimacy from our culture is that intimacy is a gray area. A few years back they came out with a movie that said that and folks flocked to it because they thought that was what we were supposed to know with intimacy. But intimacy is not a gray area. What this lover's telling us, there is a time and there is a place. But our culture teaches us just, it's okay here and there. Because one day we'll settle down. And then we'll quit the only year and there. But we have to keep the fire in the fireplace. Now, I, I, I love watching the reactions when I said that. Because all of a sudden I watched a bunch of guys go, because they're thinking, I got this one covered. And I watched the way they go, because they're thinking, I got this one covered. I don't fool around. I mean, I'm not having an affair. But honestly, you know how many guys I see flirting with females that's not their wife? we got to keep the fire in the fireplace. You, you know how many females I see 
or hear about. They're either watching or they're reading their love stories. What are we doing? We've got to keep the fire. There's a time and a place for intimacy. And that's in marriage. And friends, if we fail to keep intimacy contained in marriage into its proper time and its proper place, it will ruin that marriage relationship. You want to have a great marriage? Keep the fire in the fireplace. Now, let me give you number three. Number three is my favorite because it says this, get rid of the foxes. You want to have a great marriage, you need to get rid of the foxes. And verse 15 is where we're going to jump to. Here's what it says. Catch for us the foxes. The little foxes that ruin the vineyards are vineyards that are in bloom. Why do you not want the little foxes in the vineyards? Are you afraid they'll eat the fruit? No, it's deeper than that. Because when a fox would get in the vineyard, a fox would dig and it would burrow until it was under the roots. And it would totally destroy the whole vine. So it wasn't just it ate the fruit and the fruit's going to come back next year. It would totally destroy that vine to where that vine was not good anymore. And here's what she says. Catch for us the little foxes. We need to get rid of the foxes. Because just like these little foxes, there's a lot of little tiny things that tend to undermine our marriage. There's a lot of little things that undermine our relationships. And what it does is when those undermine and they undermine and they, under, they get to the root and they destroy the relationship. One of the reasons why 60% of American marriages end in divorce is because of these little foxes. And notice she warns her lover that the foxes are out to destroy your love. Guys, have you ever noticed that often it's the female who recognizes the little foxes? Sometimes we can be kind of out dumb, I guess is the best way to put it. And they'll go, you need to watch out there. Or I'm a little worried about that. That they recognize the little foxes long before we do. Sometimes we need to pay attention to them and quit being guys. You know, you know what we do. It's okay. There's nothing going to happen. you got to watch out for the little foxes. So, you say, well, what are some of the foxes that can destroy your marriage? Well, what are some of the foxes that eat away the roots until the marriage is suffering? Well, let's look at a couple. Well, we could do a list, but, but I come up with three that, that I want to give us a Number one is the work fox. The work fox. Because often we're overworked. Overworked makes us overstressed. Overstress makes us feel unappreciated. And what does that do? That undermines and attacks the root of our marriage. So one of the things we have to watch out for, we have to watch out for the work fox. Because sometimes our job is actually tearing up our marriage. Number two that I came up with, I call it the kid fox. Sometimes our children, we let them be the little foxes. Let's face it about kids. Kids are demanding, aren't they? They demand our time. They demand our finances. They, they demand our attention. But think about, you know, think about what we give to our kids. So think about how we're involved. You know, there, there's homework, there's school, there's ball, there's dance, there's activities. That's not to mention the, the laundry, the meals, the health. Now, every parent will say, I will gladly do that for my child. Every, every parent will do that. But, how often do we let those things become the little foxes to where our marriage is suffering because all of our attention is paid to our kids? Sometimes our kids can be the foxes. Say, so how do I know? Because after doing all these things with and for our kids, at night we go to bed and sleep. There's no difference if we're letting those foxes get into our marriage. 
Our kids can be that fox digging away. We have to be very careful of that. You know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I, I just want to tell you. I know what some of you are thinking. I can handle it. I can handle it. And some folks thrive on it. I love being that parent who has a child in 17 sports activities in one season. I love being that parent that, that, that my kids have straight A's. The, the other day, I, I was up at one of our schools, and, and I was watching if some of the kids was coming in, and it was on Monday with Valentine's Day. And they come in carrying their Valentine boxes. And it's a good thing I'm not a teacher. Because I was sitting at home, at home with most of the kids and said, Mom and Dad, you did good. Because it was always, that child didn't make that monstrosity. Them parents have been up all night making them boxes. Why? Was that box any different than if they just took a shoebox with a slot in it? Sure it was. Because my kid has to have the biggest box. Or the nicest fox. What are we letting our kids do? Be the fox. So we have to watch out for the work fox. We have to watch out for the kid fox. But this one's a tough one. I think the third fox we have to be careful of is the self-importance fox. Now, you notice I made these up, right? But, but I think they're real. It's that fox that, that where we say, I'm that important. And when we get that, uh, that self-importance idea, it, it, it ruins our marriage. Because now, we're not holding that banner of love over our spouse. <laughs> we're holding that banner of love over ourselves. And it's the self-importance box. When we think that it's important for us to keep up with everything and everybody, we have to be a part of certain circles. We have to do certain things. Well, and, and we want those things because it shows our self-worth. It shows how important we are. I read an article the other day, and it was very interesting. I started to share it on our family Facebook page, and I thought, no, I better not get myself in trouble. So I decided to wait and tell you about it. And the, art, the article was about the tool that has made us self-important. Anybody want to guess what that tool is? Right there. Now, I, I just lost 50% of you. I, I guarantee you. Because we know we can't live without that thing, can we? Did you realize the cell phone has only been popular for less than 25 years? I mean, from the time when they started, folks started really getting cell phones, and, and so only about 25, it wasn't, it wasn't until after 2000 that the, the folks really started having it. And now today it's like, I forget how many billion people have cell phones. But, but the article said that, that, that we look at our phone as that thing that makes us important. Why do we have it? Do we need it? We got along before we had it without it. So do we need it? But what if somebody needs to get in touch with me? <laughs> what, 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 what if I need to get in touch with someone else? See, you need to stop and think about it. The article's kind of right. Our phone is our tool, often, that makes us feel important. And we use that as our self-importance. It displays how important we are. I mean, think about it. How many, it was none of us. I know that it was none of us, but we know people, right, who got rid of a perfectly good phone to get the newer model. My phone now has 14 cameras instead of 13 because that'll take my picture. Of me. <laughs> we know people, right? Who, now, what is it? Is it not a tool of self importance? But what happens in our relationships when we have that self importance box digging away at the roots? Let me ask you all that. I want you to be honest with yourself. I want us to see if this has become a tool of self-importance for us, for those of you who are married. At what time do you put the phone away so that you can concentrate on your spouse? Hmm. 
Everybody commence to pray right now. <laughs> you know what that means? That means it's time to get rid of the foxes. Those foxes are the things that we're allowing to undermine our marriage. And, and for you, it may be something totally different than, than what we've looked at today. But it's a fox. And, and, and it's, it's digging away slowly at the roots of your marriage. Fly love the banner. Keep the fire in the fireplace and get rid of the foxes. Now I know, you call a woman now. You're saying, Pastor Dan, I came this morning so I could learn to understand the opposite sex. But I'll tell you what, when you do those three things in your marriage, I guarantee you, you will better understand the opposite sex. When love is the banner that you fly. When the fire stays where it needs to stay. And when the boxes are taken away. Now, just for the record, I'm not telling anybody to do away with their kids. <laughs> but don't let your kids be the fox. You know, Honestly, when we look at those things, we understand. Let me ask you this morning three important questions. Three important questions that, that your answer will determine how your marriage is. Question number one, is your spouse confident in your love for them this morning? Is your spouse confident of your love for them. Number two, are you keeping the fire in the fireplace? And number three, what's become the little fox in your marriage relationship? Because honestly, when we answer those three questions, then we begin to understand our spouse. You're saying, okay, Pastor Dan. Now I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about this call in my marriage relationship. What do I need to do about it? And the answer is actually very simple. That's put God's plan for marriage back in place. Put God's plan for your marriage back where it needs to be. Follow God's priorities for marriage. Number one, needs to be God. The first and most important treasure in your life needs to be your relationship with Jesus Christ. And maybe this morning, it's not there. It's time for it to be. We need to trust Jesus in two ways. Number one, we need to trust him as our Savior. And maybe this morning, you've been depending on yourself for eternal life. Oh, I'll be good enough. I'll go to church enough times. I'll do enough good deeds. I'll say enough good things. That, that, that I'll be okay. But our Bible tells us that Jesus is the way. The truth and the life. And nobody comes to the Father except for Him. No matter how good we are, we can't be good enough for salvation. We need to make Jesus our Savior. And number two, we need to make Jesus our Lord. And that means we make Him first place in our life. His will is what we want to accomplish. His glory is what we want to show. So, question number one, or, or, or place them, is Jesus first place in your life? Second, then it's your spouse. If you're married today, your spouse needs to be number two in your priority list. Because Jesus is number one. And, and then number three is your kids. Number four is the rest of your family. Now, I give you two, three, and four because a lot of folks get that out of order. I find young parents go, oh, my kids is the most important thing to me. Then I can tell you, if that's the case, your kids have become a fox. Your spouse needs to have that priority over your children. Oh, my parents, my siblings, my, my they're, they're, they're the most important. They need to fall under your kids. God's priority needs to be our priority. And then you know what comes after that? Everything else. 
That's where the job falls. That's where the friends fall. That's where our hobbies fall. It has to be God. So, is Jesus your Savior? Is Jesus your Lord? Then your spouse. Maybe today you just need to stop and confess that sin to God. To say, I've not put my spouse at the priority that they need to be. Then your kids. Then your family. Then the other stuff. How do we get our marriages back on track? Fly that banner of love. Keep the fire in the fireplace. Get rid of the foxes. And follow God's priority for marriage. Maybe today there needs to be a change in you. As we come and sing this next song, take that time just to pray. You can do it where you're standing. You can do it here at the front of the altar. But to say, God, my marriage is that important. I'm going to follow your priority in marriage. Or maybe God's laid something on your heart that your banner's not love. Your fire's not contained. And your foxes are eating away. Then it's time to make that change. What's God want to do in your marriage today? He wants to make it stronger. But you know, those kids got to choose their treasure. We get to choose. Do we follow God's plan? Do we follow his word? Or do we keep doing it our way? Lord God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for showing us in your word how our marriages can be greater. How they can be stronger. And how they can honor you more. And Lord, I pray for every married couple I pray for every soon-to-be-married couple, and I pray for every person that, that, that one day will be married. That today, we make a commitment to follow your way, your will, and your word in our marriages. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us?